our church has been going through uh, Tony Evans' study, the power of Jesus' names. Uh, we still have some books back there if you would like one. This will be the last week we uh, have them available back there. Uh, I actually think that the Tony Evans book has been the best of all the studies we've done over the years. I think it's the best book that we've gotten. I, I'd encourage you to pick it up if you haven't. There, there's some back there. And uh, I've been pr preaching on prayer. Uh, Tony Evans talks about the power of Jesus' names. I want to talk about the power of praying in Jesus' name. D.L. Moody once said, I would much rather be a great prayer than a great preacher. Uh, we need great prayers. We need great prayers. And we need people to pray. Now, I saw a poll one time, one of those Gallup things, that said that the, some of the most pessimistic people in the United States are evangelicals. And I'm thinking, how in the world have they read the gospel? Have they read the Bible? And let me just tell you something. There's a lot of people pretty negative in our world today. God isn't one of them. We pray to a God who can make things happen. And I want you to pray and to pray boldly, to pray all the time, and to understand you're praying to a God that can make a difference. Not only can he make a difference, he wants to make a difference. Not only that, he believes it can happen. Do you think God sent Jesus to this world to die on a cross for our sins because he thought we would just do nothing? Let me tell you what God believes. God believes that if Jesus is held up and people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they receive Jesus, that they're going to change. Our world needs prayer to this God who believes that we can change, that we can become part of the kingdom right now. You know, we hear all kinds of negative things about China. But you know what I know? I know the church is thriving in China. You know, I know they're being persecuted, but they're growing and growing and growing. And I can't wait till one of these times when their leader over there is a Christian. I believe I'm going to see it. I know in some of these Muslim countries, it's really tough. They've outlawed Christianity. You can't talk to a Muslim about being a Christian or anything like that. Yet, you know what I know? I know that in Iran, they're coming to Christ in the tens of thousands. I know former Al-Qaeda and ISIS people who lived very dark lives are now coming to Christ all over the world. And you know, we can reach those people by prayer. I've got a young lady, I don't know her, never talked with her, but she tunes into my coffee with the pastor every day. I, probably not morning where she's at, but wherever she's at. She's in Vietnam, on there every day. I know nothing about her, but I know that she wants to hear me teach on Genesis every day. I pray for her. And I know God hears my prayer, and I know God touches her. Even though I'm here, she's there. Our world needs prayer. Our country needs prayer, doesn't it? Oh, man. We are so divided. And I get depressed thinking about it. But you know what I know? We're praying to God that can change things. I mean, his name, I am, I am, Yahweh. Don't tell my Hebrew teacher I said his name. 
He gets very mad at me when I do that. Um, but uh, I am, and, and it can be interpreted, I am the one that makes things happen. He can make things happen in our country. Jesus is lifted up. People come to his kingdom. Our church needs your prayer. Man, God's given us this building. Uh, the guy who did our sound was doing some work here the other day, and he stopped in and talked to me. He said, Robert, what do you think this place would cost if you all had to buy it from, do it from ground up? I said, well, we've been told anywhere from 60 to 70 million. And he looks at me and says, I take it you all don't have that much in there. I said, no. And I said, that doesn't include 12 acres of paid parking lot that we've got. He said, Robert, I don't know. He says, I, I deal with a lot of big churches and everything. He said, I'm not sure the price wouldn't be $100 million. I don't know. But you know what? We know God's gifted us here. But he wants us to do something with it. But he doesn't want to do us to do it in, in our power. He wants us to pray and have the power of God when Jesus is lifted up to do it. Can't wait. Well, let's talk about praying today. I want to talk about praying persistently. The one thing Jesus taught us is, is, is to pray. And I've got a lot of scripture to read today, so just act like we're singing and stand with me for a while. We begin with Luke chapter 11. And the Bible says, Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. You notice Jesus prays a lot. As he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And they're listening to Jesus praying and they're realizing Jesus prays differently than they do. They want to pray like Jesus. So should we. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Now, this is Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. And forgive us our sins and, and w as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't, lead us. and don't let us yield to temptation. Then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed and I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your, I love this word, shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give him a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then in chapter 18. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God, or I care, do I care about people? I 
but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to the chosen, to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Well, Jesus makes a huge point here. We are to pray persistently and not give up. I love that in Luke eleven eight, 8, where he says that you're to shamelessly persist. Uh, another translation of that had it, audacity, to have the audacity to persist. We are to pray and not give up. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. That's what these passages taught. The passage is taught that God wants you to pray even if you think you're being a pest. He doesn't want you to quit. He wants you to ask. He wants you to knock. He wants you to be there saying, God, I want this. You have not because you ask not. Jesus prayed hard. We're about to go into the Easter season and the Garden of Gethsemane, and many of you have been with me to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we've been in the garden. We've seen where Jesus prayed, and you can imagine, and there's actually olive trees that were there at the time of Jesus' prayer. That amazes me, but, but you can pray there where he prayed, but you think about how he prayed that night, and he prayed so hard that he sweat blood. Drops of blood came from him. He was so intense in his praying. Now, that's intense praying, isn't it? That's pleading, and what he was asking for, he didn't get. He said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. He asked it three times, and God Nope. It's the only way I got for salvation of mankind is, is, is the cross. And Jesus accepted it. But he pleaded with God. And folks, I want you to know something. We need to learn how to plead with God. We need to learn how to pray intensely. We need to, have to learn how to pray and never give up. I told you when I began this series, this series was for me. If you get something out of it, that's okay. Because I believe I pray wimpy prayers. I really do. I think God wants to do so much. I think he wants to maybe do revival in Vietnam through that girl that's listened to me on Coffee with the Pastor. And I'm praying for her that she'll do that. He wants to change the world through our prayers. And folks, he wants to bring revival to Texas City and this whole area because of First Baptist Church, if we'll pray. And believe God. You know, you got family stuff going on. You pray for your family every day. I hope you take some time every day for, for every one of your family members by name and what issues they may have. Play with God for them. Pray and never give up. Because here's the thing, God wants to answer our prayer. Did you ever think about that? God wants to hear from us, and he wants to answer our prayer. I love the two stories that, that Jesus told. The first one is that a guy has an unexpected guest at midnight. Guy's hungry. Didn't have any bread in his house. So he goes to his neighbor's house. He knocks on the door and says, Hey, neighbor, I need some bread. I need three loaves of bread. The neighbor says, I'm in bed. My family's in bed. I'm not getting up to get you bread. 
Jesus says he's not going to be a good neighbor. He's not going to get to you a good neighbor, but he's going to be a good neighbor because he's going to keep knocking. You're going to keep yelling. You're going to keep him up until he finally gets bothered enough where he gets up and does it. He says he's going to do it by your shamelessly, shameless persistence. Now here's, well, let's go to the next one. The other story he told was about an unjust judge and talked about how that uh, there was a judge one time and a widow lady, apparently somebody was mistreating her, so she went to court trying to get justice, and the judge didn't care anything about her, so she says, give me justice, and he didn't do anything. So guess what? Every time he gets ready to go to court, you know who's standing outside? That widow going, give me justice. That guy gets ready to go home, you know who's standing outside? Give me justice. That guy gets ready to go to the racetrack, you know where that is there? Give me justice. Everywhere he goes, this like, man says, I don't care about God, I don't care about her, but I'm going to give her justice because she's wearing me out. Now, too often people have misread those things. Well, they think, well, you know, God's up here not really wanting to answer prayer, and so we'll just keep banging and beating until God finally gets tired of us asking, and he'll do it. No, that's not how that goes. What Jesus is saying is, you got a neighbor who will do the right thing even though he doesn't want to. you got an unjust judge who will do the right thing even though he doesn't want to. But then you've got a God who wants to, who will listen to you and will hear you first time. It's a study of contrast. you got a sorry neighbor and you got an unjust judge, but then you've got a loving God who loves you has chosen you, has given his son to die for you, and wants to hear your prayer. He not only wants to hear your prayer, he wants to answer your prayer. He not only wants to answer your prayer, he wants to give you a whole lot more than you've ever asked for. Wow. So I end the sermon today just with what Jesus said. Jesus encourages us to ask, seek, and knock. This is what he says. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking. And you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. Now, I can't end this sermon without having a time of prayer. So I'm going to ask you to maybe bow your head and close your eyes and go to the inner sanctuary of your soul. And I'm going to ask you to join me in to say no more wimpy prayers. And I want you right now to pray. I want you to pray with that shameless persistence, with the audacity to ask for big things. What is it in your life that you need the most right now from God? Would you ask him for it? What do you need from God right now? Is there a family member you have that needs something big from God right now? Will you ask God for it?
Will you pray for this church, that God will put his hand upon this church, he'll anoint this church, that there will be people who will come to Christ, people who will be discipled, people's lives will be changed through what he's done here. Will you pray for our country? Pray what you believe needs to happen in our country that you would like to see God do in our country. Will you pray for our world? Father God, we've prayed some big prayers today. There have been lots of big prayers. Asking for big things to be done. Asking for God-sized tasks to be done. Jesus asked if there's going to be any faith. Father, I pray that we pray these prayers in faith. Believing. Knowing that you want to answer them. Knowing that you love us and you care more than we do. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. And Lord, we pray it in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.